Legion, it's Hadrian. Thank you for being here and welcome back to Strategy School in Civilization VI Rise and Fall. Don't forget to check out the series overview if you're just watching for the very first time. What we're going to cover in this video are two topics once again. We're going to cover primarily the introduction to diplomacy. And when I say the introduction to diplomacy, I mean the intro to the intro. Diplomacy in Civilization VI, as you might imagine, is a complicated topic because it's a game about history and how civilizations across the globe interact with one another peacefully or not as the game progresses. So obviously there's the introduction to the topic, there's the proper discussion of the topic and its intricacies, and then there are more advanced features that kind of develop as the game goes on. So we will probably touch on all of those in separate videos. And this is just going to be about this moment that we have on the screen right here. And some of the first things that you can do to maybe establish some goodwill or find out about another civilization that you've just encountered in the opening turns of the game, but also how you can prepare once this moment arrives, because there's always this kind of feeling of, uh, well, it's on now. The game has officially begun. We're not just trying to get our feet, you know, under us anymore. I mean, we might very well be in a lot of cases. That's the exact place you will be when you meet your first civilization. You'll kind of be like, oh man, well, I'm still trying to make sure I was ready. But now the game's begun because there is another civilization. They are watching you. They're going to be immediately thinking about whether or not they want to attack you and vice versa. You're going to be thinking about whether or not you are going to be friends or uh, whether you don't feel like being friends with this civilization. So that's definitely worth talking about at length for most of the video. But we are also going to play through a few turns and then we're going to get to a point where we found our Pantheon. In this video, I'll talk a little bit about what that is and cover that topic in the final minutes of the video. It's a much less complex topic, but it's worth touching on. And we are going to start trying to play through, with the exception of a few more of the upcoming episodes, we're going to start to play through some more turns in each video, which I'm frankly kind of excited about because it's less kind of note taking for me and it'll turn more into a more organic you watching as I play, me explaining what I do type of experience, which not only might be more engaging in certain ways, but uh, and less information coming at you in dense packages, but also um, we will have just covered the basics. And so we'll be able to, you know, take that more relaxed approach, which is nice for me, too. So you have this moment at the beginning of every friendship or the opposite of friendship with any civilization you meet. And you always have two options presented to you after you have met another civilization for the first time. If the encounter happens within six tiles of one of their cities. In other words, if basically if you found them or if they discover your unit during their turn, but you're closer to their cities, if you're within six tiles of one of their cities and didn't know it yet, they will offer you their hospitality and that city's location will be revealed to you. If the encounter happens within six tiles of one of your cities, you have the option of offering your hospitality and revealing your city to them. So as you can see, that's what's happened here. Germany has waltzed a unit into our territory or near our territory, and they now know that I am in the area and we have the opportunity to extend our hand and say, hey, would you like to come and visit? And we would actually reveal our city's location without learning anything about where Germany is. If neither player, though, has a city within six tiles, if the encounter happens out in the wilds, an offer will be made to exchange information on one another's capitals, revealing these cities' locations to each player. And notice that it's capital cities too. It's not just the closest player or the closest city to the encounter, but it's the capital cities of each player in that meeting that will be revealed if the meeting happens out in the wilds. So the main thing that you need to know about this initial interaction is that it's extremely inconsequential except for the control of information. You can say yes or no to any of these options. Well, either of these, but any of the many options I might have just mentioned that are presented to you. There's very little reason to say no to being invited to one of your opponent's cities, of course. If you are the one that found them and they are offering to let you come and visit, then yeah, find out where they are. But the diplomatic impact, regardless of what you do, is virtually non-existent most of the time. You will want to pay attention as the game continues to be developed, because of course this is a tutorial that's being recorded in May and June and July of 2018. So there could be civilization specific, there could be mod specific changes that, that impact what I'm saying here. But most of the time, you can answer this question however you like. But Hadrian, I hear you asking, what's the best answer? What do I say? Well, whatever you think is best for your civilization. Don't overthink this. At the point in history that you're meeting a new leader, what do you need? If you want to make this leader wait another turn or two or three or five before they learn where you are, 
because you suspect that once they find you, they're likely to be aggressive, then make them wait. Just remember, 99 times out of 100, this first interaction is not going to be the dialogue that causes an early game war to break out. So don't worry about it. It's what comes in the next turns that will make or break that decision. In this moment, it's just about the control of information. So let it be about that and do what's best for your Civ. So I'm going to go ahead with that in mind, and I'm going to say, you know what? I'll be nice. Would you like to visit our nearby city and sample our hospitality? Germany says, thank you, friend. Gives me a nod of approval and says, thank you. Now, we have met another civilization, which gave us the boost for writing. So now we're only four turns away from writing, which is nice. Exchanging. Okay. And we've also finished the foreign trade civic, which is quite nice. So a couple of things here. Actually, did I? No, it was just the tech boost. We, we completed this civic organically. So I have the option to change policies. Let's very quickly look at this and see if there might be anything that's worth switching to. I am not going to change this policy because having the faith per turn is helping us earn our pantheon. And then the extra combat strength when fighting barbarians is definitely handy at the moment because there's a few barbarian units that are near me. So we're going to leave that alone. Now, one little thing about, well, where the heck is Germany? You might be wondering is, well, where the, <laughs> where's Germany? Like, we can't see any of those units on the map. And, I mean, we could click Frederick Barbarossa here and pull up the diplomacy screen, which we'll talk about in a second. But obviously, if you're brand new to civilization, if you're at the exact same moment in the game that I am right now, you might be going, uh, what? Like, where, where's Germany? Use this notification. You can use this to find out where they found you. So... Usually, it's a, it can be a little bit tough to figure out, but. So it looks like it was right around this area. They might have had a unit step up onto this hilltop and then step back as soon as they found me. Usually the AI's scouts, not the barbarian scouts. Well, the barbarian scouts do this too. But AI civilization scouts will do this. They'll kind of step into your territory, find you, and kind of go, oh crap, and duck back into the fog of war. And it's I think it's an intentional programming behavior because they don't... The scouts don't want you to be able to track their movements. They're scouts, so they're going to dip back to where you're less likely to be able to see them. So that's why we can't see where Germany is. But Germany is somewhere down here, and we're going to have to do a little bit of looking around to figure out exactly where they are. But let's continue to talk about this moment and some things that you can do now that you've met another civilization. So there is always that kind of feeling, as I mentioned, of it's on now. The game has officially begun. We're going to talk more about AI personality and agendas in an upcoming video because that does, again, have enough of its own details to be its own topic. For now, let's just talk about this first encounter. What does this mean now that we know Germany's here and that Germany is maybe relatively close by? Uh, should we be worried? That's kind of the question that comes to mind, right? To answer the second question first, uh, probably yes. Especially on higher difficulty, earlier civilizations are really simple-minded. This is the ancient era. Philosophy hasn't been invented yet, and law is still kind of a novel, pretty concept. So other civilizations are most likely to see you as competition and try to kill you. Seriously. Especially if they don't think that you're that strong. So to that end, having an early military can be good because it affects the AI's evaluation of you as a prospect for conquest. Even if your military is just for defense, having those early game military units can be pretty handy. Later in the game, civilizations do embrace more diplomacy, and it's easier to get civilizations to warm up to you. But early in the game, it's a free-for-all. So you might get to a point where you're more likely to be greeted with civility than with a club or a sword. But in the early game, you should expect the sword most of the time. So again, should you be worried? Yeah, probably. Especially with certain civilizations that you can count on to be more warlike. So a couple of things about how this is a bit of a free-for-all. In the first several turns of the game, which we're going to see more of once we actually find where Germany is, but you can see that our borders are still dotted because we haven't researched the ability to close our borders yet. Nobody's borders are actually enforced. These borders are just kind of an ethereal concept right now. That's what these dashes are saying. They're not solid yet. All borders in the beginning of the game count as open, which after you close them, as you might imagine, becomes a diplomatic offer you can make so that your lands are accessible only to your friends. But for now, in the beginning, it's this free-for-all, which means you can enter another player's territory and, f and fully scout their cities, for instance. We might be able to do that in the coming turns. Other civilizations do still care about their borders. You should note this. So, in general, they still won't like you marching units 
along their borders. They won't like you, you know, kind of investigating the area around them. Even scouts hanging out in and around their borders, they will kind of turn their nose up to. So you should still be mindful of borders, but you don't have to worry about the borders constraining your movement. You can move through an enemy's territory at will. And the same is true with city-state borders for the time being. Notice these are also dashed lines. So I can definitely go up to Toronto and just kind of march around to my heart's content if that's the, the approach that I want to take with my scouting. But they will still get frustrated with you if you do that. So one small caveat, declaring war will kick any units that you have inside their borders to just outside of them. So you might have listened to everything I just said and thought, sweet, well, in that case, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to march an army right up to the enemy's capital city, get it surrounded, and then declare war because I can get them into the borders without any trouble. Actually, no. Even though you can march the units up to the capital and you can set that up perfectly, the moment you declare war, it's going to kick all of your units out to outside of the borders. It's going to do this no matter at what point you do it in the game. Just be aware. You can't quite be that devious but you can still do much more in terms of scouting with ease than you're going to be able to get away with later on. So what do you do? Unless you've decided, like the AI sometimes does, that you hate your opponent immediately, if you feel like you can spare the gold, send a delegation. And this is the answer you're going to get a lot of the time. They've gone back and forth on this in the patch notes for Civilization VI, uh, or in the patches for Civilization VI. They've, they've done some to make the AI more likely or less likely, and it seems that in more recent play, I mean, here we are playing on Prince, and I've just met Germany, and they're, he, he doesn't seem too impressed by me. So he's not willing to accept a delegation from me right away. But keep trying, because there are some useful things to sending a delegation. What does this do? It impacts, first of all, your diplomatic access to them. It gives you one level of diplomatic access. And this lasts, by the way, until you gain the Diplomatic Service Civic much later on. So this is an early game way to kind of establish a friendly connection with another player. And if they like you enough, they will send a delegation right back, which means that you get your gold back. It's an exchange of gold, and it becomes basically an exchange of goodwill between civilizations. So it does cost 15 gold to do this, but it can be a worthwhile investment. As far as... And by the way, this screen, we will talk more about this in a coming episode. Trust me. So... What does increased diplomatic access mean, though? Well, it means you'll be able to hear rumors from your delegates that you send, allowing you glimpses into the activities of your neighbors. And because it's just a delegation at first, and it's the ancient era, you won't hear a lot of detail. You'll hear over a distance, so you won't necessarily know a lot of specifics of what's going on. But you should still try and send a delegation to get access to that information. Even if your aim is immediately to conquer all of the things and like you don't necessarily want the civilization to live a long time, send a delegation, even though it's a friendly action, because that's going to give you more information on the civilization, which you might be able to use against them in some way. So obviously we're going to see the diplomatic access mechanic expand and deepen as we get farther into the game and factors such as trade and espionage come into play. For now, just be happy that you've taken your first step and that you kind of know the basic approach to how to treat that first encounter and some of the things that you can do. So those are the very basics of initial interactions. What else should you do? What are some other things to think about now that we're at this moment? Well, begin thinking about how you plan to secure any territory between you and your new neighbor. That's number one. Whatever you might have been planning to build next, you might want to think about a settler instead. Consider even taking a break from whatever you're building to start that settler immediately. I'm not going to worry about that because we have a settler on the way to a new settlement location. They're going to be there very soon, as a matter of fact, so I'm not worried about it. This settler is going to take... It's going to be turn um, 18 before we can settle the city, because they're going to move here, and then they're going to move there, but it's going to take all of their movement to get to that tile, so it'll be the beginning of two turns from now, after this turn's movement, that we can actually settle this city. So that'll happen, but because we already have a settler on the move, I'm not going to worry about starting a new settler. But there is an argument to maybe getting another one going so I can have a city down here where I said I wanted to, since I'm reasonably confident this is where Germany is. Again, we did that by clicking on this notification right here. We're actually going to clear these really quickly. And notice we did get a historic moment. More on that coming up very soon. Again, that's a rise and fall topic, and it's not as central to core, core gameplay. But it is coming up closer and closer now. So, another thing to consider... If the AI seems to be dangerously close to you, 
like unusually close to you. Maybe rather than building a settler right away, as I was just saying, start building your invasion force. Which brings me to an important final thought on this first topic of diplomacy and the introduction to interacting with other civilizations. The episode before this one was about settling new cities, right? But settling new cities isn't always the fastest way to grow your civilization. You know the expression, Rome wasn't built in a day, that old adage? Well, Rome didn't settle all of its cities, either. One piece of advice, when you're playing at Prince or Higher, you're going to have to back your armies with good research and policy decisions, or you'll have a hard time doing any conquering in the early game. But you have the option of establishing armies to conquer other civilizations early on as a means of getting your next several cities instead of settling them yourself. So that is one very, very important strategy note to keep in mind as you decide what kind of player you're going to be overall and what kind of player you're going to be in each game. Here are two hints for that particular approach. You want to declare war and be winning handily before walls are invented (laughs) if you're going to be doing any kind of fighting in the early game. Because again, especially on higher difficulty, conquering with some of these basic units is going to be challenging. And uh, secondly, get some archers. Archers are cool. So if you're not looking for a fight though, then keep your units, including scouts, as I mentioned, well away from their borders as much as possible. Leave them alone and start trying to figure out their agenda, which we're going to be talking about really soon. So now let's play for a bit until we get to our Pantheon and I'll quickly touch on that topic before we wrap up. So we do have the option of going to a new project and I'm going to go ahead and get uh, craftsmanship because what I would like to do is move towards political philosophy as soon as possible. And that is obviously, it's a good ways away right now, but that represents the next tier of governments that will be available to me. And as you might see already, these represent policy slots and the ability to expand the bonuses I can give to my civilization. So that's a big yes, please from me. And I'm going to go for that as soon as I can. So obviously we need craftsmanship if we're going to move down the tree towards that. I'll select that, which will also give me access to the Ilkum economic policy and the Agoge military policy, which we talked about a little bit earlier on. Now let's see, this builder can stay put for now. I'll go ahead and skip their turn. And then these guys, we had this warrior heading up to this encampment. I'm going to go ahead and put them right on top. Oh, you know what? Hang on. Oops. <laughs> had that switched on for uh, some of my own play earlier. But for the purposes of the tutorial, it helps keep things a little bit more straightforwardly paced. Okay, so I'm going to keep this scout fortified. He is going to get attacked by those warriors, but that's okay, because he's fortified and he's going to do a little bit more damage to them in this current stance. He might still have to, um, this is how much damage he would do if he attacked, but it's a very different projection if the barbarian attacks the scout while it's fortified. So we're not necessarily going to be in that bad of a way, as you're seeing on this projection here, with the combat going the other way. So this attack is about to happen, though, for sure. Let's go ahead and move this. We don't have to do this. The game would have done it for me in the next instant, but we're two turns away from finishing our holy site, which is going to help us get towards that pantheon. And there we go. That's a sight you'll never get tired of seeing. Barbarian warriors getting poked in the face by the scouts. Notice he did heal 10 HP at the end of the turn. So I'm just going to keep him fortified there because notice that healing actually brought their health pretty even. And the more damaged the Barbarian unit is, the less strong it is against the scout. And the scout's healing every turn, so they can keep throwing themselves at my scout if they want. That's that's just going to give the scout experience, and we'll slowly kill the Barbarian warrior while I work on these guys over here. So I could attack these guys first if I wanted to. And I'm kind of tempted to, to tell you the truth. Because this would be... A much more consequential victory, and it gives me just as much experience with this unit. Now I am noticing that we have a Barbarian Scout approaching this builder here. So what I'm going to do, for safety's sake, we're going to move this builder into the woods. And we're going to move this builder up into Orc. That way, if that Scout were to try and capture my unit, which, we, which it was probably thinking about doing, they're going to have a little bit of a harder time. All right, now we're going to move this settler into location. Again, we have to wait till the start of turn 18 to actually found the city. Okay, here we go. We actually can see a German unit now, which is good. I want them to 
mess with that scout a little bit. We have had a Barbarian Warrior spawn up this direction. Okay, so we have finished our first district, and as a result, we got the boost towards craftsmanship. We're now only five turns away from finishing... Oh no, that's towards state workforce, my bad. The icon is so freaking similar. But yeah, so that's going to help us as we move towards political philosophy, because we built our first specialty district. So since we've done that, we now have some new options. Well, we have one new option. We can build a shrine, which will give us not only faith, but great profit points per turn. That's another topic we're going to be covering very, very soon. And technically, we could already talk about at length. But for now, I'm going to leave it be um, as a topic. We might go ahead and build the shrine. The only thing I want to think about is whether or not I might want a granary first. And the truth is that I feel like I might. It could help the city grow a lot faster. Let's see. This would be four turns, this would be three. I could also train an additional military unit, for instance, a slinger, which at this point, honestly, would be a pretty good idea because it seems like there is a good number of barbarians in the area. I think I will, especially since we know Germany is nearby. We also have the option of buying a unit. So I could buy the slinger now that I have 90 gold. Let's do that. That way we have a ranged unit. The advantage of the slinger being that they can attack units in the next tile without taking damage. And they will upgrade into archers before long. Hmm. If I attack these guys, the warrior should level up? Not quite. <laughs> I'm playing vanilla Civilization VI, and obviously I'm used to playing with slightly different configurations when it comes to experience and leveling up. Because I mod the game a lot in my normal play. Okay. So since we bought the Slinger outright, I think what I will do is I do want to go for some extra food, but I've got a lot of food already, given the makeup of the tiles around my city. So I'm going to be grateful for what I have, <laughs> and we're going to get the shrine building in Uruk. Now we need, should have been clicking that, there we go, 16 faith to found a pantheon. So we are very, very close. We're going to keep that builder there for now, nothing to do with either of them. We're going to, we're going to settle this city, and there we go. It has been randomly named the city of Ur, or Ur, if you prefer, and we have an interesting choice in front of us. We could build a monument, we could build a granary, we could build a holy site, any of which would be good. We also have the option of going for some culture per turn. The monument would, of course, increase that by, that's what I mean by going for culture per turn. Or we can go for a granary so that the city starts uh, expanding sooner. But the city, once again, similarly to what I was saying a moment ago, has a lot of food all around it. They've got the marsh tile, we've got the horses, we've got the cattle. So I'm going to go ahead and start with a trader, first and foremost. And I'll talk more about the, that decision a little bit later on when we get to the trade topic. Ooh, interesting. So our warrior is going to have to back off now. Actually, no, he won't. Notice by keeping that scout in position, we have now defeated those barbarians. Now, very interestingly, this warrior... Hmm... This is where it becomes a bit of a chess game. So I am going to move this slinger. Again, he gets the bonus movement from starting in the capital, so the river doesn't count. I'm going to move this slinger all the way up here. He's not going to be able to attack, but he's going to present a threat to this warrior and help me manage the fact that I'm kind of surrounded. This spearman's almost dead, but if I promote this guy now, he's going to get the combat strength versus melee and ranged units and heal by 50 points, which is really pretty dang nice. All right, so this scout, I'm going to keep him fortified for now because I don't want to lose my scout. And we're going to go to the next turn. Looks like we are done with riding. Now, there's a very important reason that you want to have the slinger involved in the action early on. Okay, this could be a little dicey here. My warrior is substantially stronger than all of the units currently surrounding it. 
But they managed to, before I killed the spearmen, they managed to spawn another warrior up here. And this slinger might not have what it takes to withstand an attack if I don't withdraw them this turn. So our knowledge of bronze working has advanced considerably. Your fight with barbarians highlight the need for stronger weaponry. Right, so we got a boost to that. All you have to do is cross out the wrong words. <laughs> yeah, so simple. All right, so we now have access to the campus district, which will help us speed up our research as we've discussed. And now another interesting choice is ahead of us. I think I will go ahead and go for animal husbandry, given that that will give us access to horses as soon as possible. And I'm actually going to start moving this builder. It's a little risky. I didn't mention this with the settler, but it's always a little bit dicey when you move a settler or any kind of civilian unit that can be captured by barbarians out into the wilds. Let's see. Yeah, if we were to attack, they wouldn't be able... None of these units would, would be able to hit the slinger this turn if they tried to move. So I'm going to go ahead and attack because this will level the slinger up. If this unit attacks, they'll damage the slinger, but they won't kill it. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move this warrior down into the woods. The woods will be advantageous defensive terrain for me if this warrior attacks, and it prevents me from being under threat by this warrior right away. We'll keep that builder right there for now. Actually, let's go ahead and move him. The, ooh, that might have been a bad idea. We'll see if I regret my life decisions in just a bit. With that in mind, let me go ahead and move this scout. Wasn't the plan. Didn't realize that scout was still that close. And I will go ahead and put him on top of this hilltop. Did a little bit of scouting. And that way we're kind of saying to the barbarian AI, hey, try it. <laughs> Interesting. We have sent a diplomatic envoy to you. Treat them as you would treat me, the Duke of Swabia, King of Burgundy, King of Germany, King of the Romans, King of Italy, and Holy Roman Emperor. I, I don't know if all those titles are true, but okay. Your delegation is most welcome. Seems like a lot of titles. So now we can, well, hang on, once it's actually our turn. All right, so they did attack me in the woods. We got a defensive bonus. Now, very interestingly, this is one of the things... Ooh. I really thought, okay, that's gonna level up the Slinger, which is good. All right, they did not capture the Builder. I'm going to move you here so that you can stand on top of the hilltop. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move the slinger just one tile because I want to keep it out of range of the other units. And then we're going to promote it. We're going to give it volley. This is always a good choice if you're going more defensively because you get, as you can see, a lot more combat strength when you're occupying a district or a fort. A city center counts as a district, but this is good for just general combat against land units, anyway. And then this warrior here... I kind of want to pull him back. That's what I'm going to do. There were a few too many units in the area for my taste, and you have to do this dance with the barbarians early on in Civilization VI because they will catch you off guard, and you don't want to lose those initial units if you can help it. Okay, I'm not going to worry about that warrior for now, just doing a little bit of looking around here. Finally, to the east of Uruk, we are one turn away from being able to settle our Pantheon at last. Let's put you back in Uruk so that you don't get captured. And we are about to get our Pantheon, so this shrine isn't going to matter. We are going to get another pop soon as well, which is nice. Another citizen, <laughs> using some paradox terminology there. Okay, so that warrior, as expected, did come to say hello. Something very important. I was about to say this a moment ago and then um, was corrected because that warrior didn't die. Notice we just got a tech boost. As I started to say earlier in the episode, one of the very, very important reasons you should have a slinger out in the field early on is the boost towards archery. So now we're going to be able to complete the archery tech much faster than we otherwise would have. I'm going to put the slinger in Uruk here and have them fortify till healed. We're going to put this warrior back inside our borders, in the rainforests and in the hill. 
We're also going to... Hmm. I think it might be time to go ahead and get a campus going. So notice that I have a couple of very nice spots on which to get some additional science, mainly from adjacent mountain tiles, but also from adjacent rainforest tiles, which you can see by pointing to the bonuses. There's also this one here, and there there's another district that I can build that's unique to Rise and Fall that would actually allow me to give both of these districts certain bonuses. There, there are advantages to keeping your districts closer together, but the point is that you're playing the map. You have different decisions that you can make so I can keep them closer together and possibly make them more defensible later on. We'll talk about that when it comes to um, espionage and spies. But I'm going to go with... Yeah, we're going to have to go with Uruk. Or with, with, sorry, with this particular location. I think just by pure virtue of the fact that we're going to get the extra science. Well, yeah, we're going to do that. So we bought that tile, a little bit of extra gold to do it. We're going to start that campus district building. It's going to take three turns. And also, because we've accumulated 16 faith, let me go up to... Oh, it's not giving me the option yet. All right, fine, be that way. I'm going to dance down here just to be able to see a little bit farther with this scout. It's hoping maybe to spy Germany, but not quite yet. And now we will have the option of starting our first Pantheon. We're two turns away from Animal Husbandry, and now one turn away from Craftsmanship. If I had improved some tiles, by the way, I would have gotten that boost, and we would have been done with this already. Imagination is Craftsmanship, and gives us many useful objects, such as wickerwork picnic baskets. Again, we're not going for Sumeria's bonuses with this series, so just bear that in mind. We're not trying to play to Gilgamesh's strengths, because I want to show you kind of a generic experience of Civilization VI as much as possible. So we can now implement a policy that gives us extra production towards melee, anti-cavalry, and ranged units. Anti-cavalry are basically spearmen. We'll talk more about that soon. And 30% production towards builders if we wanted to add that as an economic policy. So now that we are in a position where we have gotten all the extra faith that we need, I'm going to go ahead and switch to urban planning as a policy. Extra production point in all cities, which is just as handy as it sounds early on. So because we have some additional citizens, or just recently grew, our progress towards early empire has advanced considerably. All right. I'm going to keep this slinger fortified. We're going to back this guy off. Just trying to lure these units as close as possible while keeping them out of danger. And with that in mind, we are going to start moving towards our first governors. But I also, since I have so much combat happening near me, as I mentioned earlier, having military tradition could be pretty handy. We're not going to talk about this this episode, but we might talk about it when it actually comes into play. Flanking and support combat bonuses. We need to clear a barbarian outpost to get the boost for this, and we were close to doing that, but they started um, spawning a number of additional units. So in order to save our units, we had to back off. And that sound is what we are concluding the episode on. Pantheons! Pantheons are kind of proto-religions. What pantheons do for you is they allow you one belief, just one and no more, with which to kind of bolster your early game based on the map or other things that are unique about your situation. I really advise you, there's no correct choice with these. There are some that are better than others. There are some that have been more recently added than others as part of the core game. If you're playing Vanilla Civ 6 versus Rise and Fall, they might look slightly different. But I really encourage you to look at each one based in the context of what we've been learning so far and what we are soon going to learn, say, about great person points and make your decision based on what you know of these bonuses because this is a way for you to customize the game to your map specifically. For instance, we have some banana tiles near us and I don't know that we have any dyes, silk, spices, sugar, or citrus. I couldn't... We got some olives here as a luxury resource somewhat nearby olives over here so yeah that wouldn't be particularly useful to me but the point is to really go through all of these and kind of see what you can do i'm going to make a choice that again will kind of keep us near the middle of the road and just give us a nice bonus that'll help us keep up but not necessarily deviate us from the average civilization experience so what i'm going to do is go for these near the bottom tend to be good for that fertility rights religious settlements 
or city patron goddess, I'm going to go for fertility rights. City growth rate is 10% higher. Really straightforward. We're going to get new citizens 10% faster. And now we have that, and we are working towards a religion. We have to earn a great profit to start a full religion, which adds two beliefs. And we'll be talking about that very, very soon. And because we have obtained a pantheon, we also have made progress towards mysticism in the form of a boost, which is awesome. So with that being said, I will go ahead and stop this episode here. And the next one is going to focus, and this is exciting for me because this was where we left off the original run of strategy school that I did earlier this year before I had to back off of it. And we are going to talk about city management in the next episode. We're going to talk all about the singular topic. Well, it's really two topics, but it all goes into the umbrella of city management. And we're going to talk about both amenities and housing in more detail at last. So we're going to take a pause from the turns for a moment longer to talk about now that we have two cities and we're about to have more than that, whether you conquer them or settle them yourself, what do you do? How do you really handle all of this territory for yourself and um, make sure that you are making good decisions for your citizens and that you're keeping your citizens happy and that the cities have room to grow, etc. We'll talk about that in the next one. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this one, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to follow along. New episodes are coming out every other day at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Comments are always welcome. Let me know what you think. and I'll see you next time.